Uh, good afternoon and welcome to the Standing Committee on Education and Economic Growth, uh, Tuesday, September uh, 20th, 1.30 in the afternoon. Uh, I'm the chair of the committee, uh, Zach Bell. We have uh, our members, Hal Perry, Gord McNeely, Lynn Lund, Trish Altes, and Brad Trevor. So we have two very special guests uh, briefing us today, actually in between classes, I believe, uh, briefing us from the University of Prince Edward Island Student Union, uh, Adam and Ibosa, but I'll get you both to uh, introduce yourselves. Before I do that, can I get a motion for adoption of the agenda? Thank you, Gord McNeely. So we're going to turn things over to you. Just say your name and your titles for Hansard, and then we'll let you start your presentation. Yeah, I'm Adam Kenzie, President and CEO of the UPI Student Union. Hi, I'm Yobo Saeed Minoeka, the Vice President of Academic and External with the UPISU. Perfect. So if you're ready to go, Adam. Yeah, so I guess I'll just start on the handout that we provided. Those are all the mental health stats that we have from this year's survey. Um, if you uh, didn't get a chance to read them, I can run through them quickly. Um, of 665 respondents, 48% of individuals found that their mental health is worse this year uh, over other years. 222 of those students reported having depression, 210 had seasonal depressions, 81 had thoughts of suicide, and 149 had anxiety related to COVID-19, 368 had general anxiety. Of 516 respondents, 33% had adverse mental health effects revolving around fear of COVID-19, 67% had mental health challenges related to the switch and switch back from online learning because of the pandemic. Of 638 respondents, 65% had not accessed any of the available mental health supports from UPEI. And then uh, the stats I have in the slideshow here are more so about um, housing and income. So I uh, will jump right into it. Uh, can, can, I, can I just actually inter uh, interrupt you there for one second, Adam? Just because I know that I think there was a problem accessing it. So is it possible for our uh, clerk to make a copy of that to hand out to the members? Because I don't oh, think yeah, the members absolutely. actually had a chance. It was just the link that I had gotten. Oh, work, I see. I, see. Right. I can distribute. Is that all right if we could? And then the, uh, the committee has a copy of the of what you just talked yeah. about. Is yeah, that okay? Sure. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Sorry about that, members, no. and then we'll uh, let you continue on there, and our clerk will uh, hand out. That, those are the stats that Adam just provided us with. Sounds good. Continue on there. I'm sorry about that interruption. Apologies. That's quite all right. Um, so first we have uh, rental prices for students. Um, rental prices haven't been terrible um, for the majority of students. Um, as you can see here, 27% uh, of students don't pay rent. <laughs> so that's, uh, that's a good thing. Um, and then the next biggest category is uh, the... 550 to $650 per month uh, with almost 14%. And then of course, uh, 350 to 450 is uh, t about 10%, 450 to 550 is 12%, uh, 650 to 750 is 11%, 750 to 850 is 8%, uh, 850 to 1,000 is 7%, and 1,000 plus is about 9%. So 1,000 plus is a lot for a student, but um, thankfully there was only uh, 64 students out of 708 that had said they they pay a thousand plus. So utilities that get included in students' rent, um, the biggest one was uh, heat with 63%, electricity at 50, snow removal was 48%, uh, lawn maintenance was 47%, and internet was 40. Three percent. Um, the maximum amount students could afford to pay uh, for rent per month. Um, so, three hundred fifty to four hundred fifty was sixteen percent of students. Four hundred fifty to five hundred fifty was fifteen percent. Five hundred fifty to six hundred fifty was eighteen percent. Six fifty to seven fifty was twenty percent. 750 to 850 was 12%, uh, 850 to 1,000 was only 11%, and 1,000 plus was only 9%. So 
So understandably so, as the amount gets larger, the percentage of students that can afford it gets smaller. Um, but thankfully, as we saw earlier, there are too many <coughs> students paying upwards of 850, so that is a, that's a good thing. Um, the month which r the rental agreement begins, obviously the majority is September, the second majority is January, um, but you can see that sometimes students, if they can't find housing, they are starting to trickle into October, November, and sometimes even December. Um, and on the other end, um, May actually surprisingly had 8%, uh, so, or 7%, so, you know, there are still, there are some students who finish off the winter semester and are on only moving into a new place at the end of the winter semester. Um, so students that work during the school year, 32% um, of students that filled out this survey do not work, um, and 6% work full time, so that's about 43 students out of 709. Um, that is quite a few uh, to be working full time while also taking full time studies. I, I can't imagine that that is easy, however I cannot relate. Um, and then zero to 10 hours a week uh, is 17%, and then the majority fall into 10 to 20 hours a week with 35. Um, I think that this would, uh, yeah, 35%. I think that the majority of this would be international students, simply because uh, domestic or Canadian-born students um, can access EI, whereas international students cannot. And of course, international students are capped at 20 hours a week. Um, it's, they're capped at working 20 hours a week outside of the university, so um, it would make sense that 35% are working 10 to 20 hours a week. And then uh, only 7% are working 20 to 30, only 3% are working 30 to 35. So, um, And then student annual income. Uh, so this kind of gives you some insight into uh, how much students, how much money students have to work off of. Um, so we'll start at over $20,000 uh, a year, 13.5%, uh, uh, about 95 students out of 709. 15 to 20,000 is about 10%. Uh, 10,000 to 15,000 was 20%. 5,000 to 10,000 is the majority with 30%. And uh, less than 5,000 was the second majority uh, with 27%. Obviously quite concerning um, that um, 27% of students that responded are making less than $5,000 a year. That is very difficult to work off of and to live off of um, while you're trying to pay tuition and uh, meet your bills. Um, and then I think we have two more here. Um, so we asked, does the cost of housing affect your ability to pursue full-time studies, such as working more hours to pay for housing? Um, out of 686 students, this was actually uh, almost a 50-50 split. Um, 374 students said no, the cost of housing does not affect their ability to pursue full-time housing, and 312 students said yes. And then finally, um, would you say that the current housing situation has affected your academic ability? Out of 709 students, um, very fortunately, only um, a little over 20% said yes, and the rest said no. That's it. That's all for our stats. That was good. Um, and I guess, um, I guess we can't really assume that uh, some of these stats are more concerning because of COVID. But at the same time, I think we can assume that. So, but we don't know that as fact. So. Perfect. So uh, are we okay to open it up to questions? Or yeah. did you have anything you wanted to present about, sir, or just right, right into questions? Just questions, I think. Mean. Sure. Questions is good? Okay, perfect. Uh, we'll start with uh, Gord McNeely. Yeah, thanks for, thanks for coming in and, and uh, giving that presentation. Um, I, I just want to, I, I know we've talked before in the past with the Student Union, and I know we kind of talked about these issues as the pressures, all around pressures on students, whether it's housing, food, mental health. It, it's there. So UPI uh, students are back. Um, there's a lot of pressure. There's 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 no real housing in in the areas that I can see of, and especially in my area. Um, the ones that get housing, I guess, are, are lucky, and and, and we see that. Can you talk about what happened to 
the, the kids who aren't here. Do you know anything more about uh, the, the, the ones that UPEI talked about not being able to come because our, our province was basically just out of housing at that time? Yeah, so um, thankfully UPEI kind of put a campaign push on that a little bit and we were very fortunate in the island way people stepped up to um, into the homestay program which is basically um, a family or an individual opens their home up to a student and it kind of is more like a family setting that, rather than a rental setting I guess um, so we had many people from the community um, become a part of that program and uh, most, if not all, of the students who were told not to come are now coming. So, good. The, uh, sorry, just if there, if you want to add on to the answer, by all means, either one of you. Yeah, Gord. Uh, yeah, that, that's good news. And I mean, the community came forward, and, and I guess it was it was. I'm worried about the bigger, the, the big picture with yeah. with what's happening. And you had some very good suggestions as president last year about foreseeing that the the province needed to. To, to step up a little bit more. We, we, we kind of talked about rental vouchers potentially. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? What would make, what would make it better for students? And, and is, the, is the province coming and supporting the students that we bring to UPEI um, with kind of the discussion and how you see that fitting in as the president? Well, I think kind of the biggest thing right now is vacancy. There's nowhere to go, even if you have the money to go. Um, I know that uh, us and the senior administration at the university are actually looking at a couple different long-term options. Uh, obviously, once the residence opens up in September of 2023, that's going to be like another almost 300 students that will be housed. Um, but. In the long term, I mean, I know there's that old cat dealership pr property um, behind Thai Express that has been looked at and hopefully will get looked at again. Um, there's, of course, Brown's Court. Um, but other than that, there's not really, there's not really anywhere to, to, to build, uh -huh. per se. Uh -huh. uh, Gord, one more, and then I can put you back on the list. I'm glad you mentioned the, that the cat dealership because I've, I've been looking at that too as well yeah. um, but from from a student from a student union we, we when we talked about there's certain people in, in Prince Edward Island getting rental vouchers for support and I remember you, you and I talked about that that it doesn't extend to students um, do you want to see a program like that for the students who are here and can't afford to live can't afford what what does the province need to do at this time to support them That, um, in terms of what the province can do to support students in terms of housing, I think providing um, affordable housing, like student dedicated housing for students, can help students with the housing crisis in Charlottetown. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah, student dedicated housing and perhaps rental vouchers or some sort of subsidized program that allows students to, you know, maybe rent from somewhere that isn't. Um, exclusive to students but allows them to rent it at for a cheaper price I, I mean I know there's a lot of apartment complexes in Charlottetown that has something very similar but for seniors um, so if we could get something like that for students I think that would go a long way thank you thank, thank you, you I put you, you back on yeah. the phone board Lynn? And thank you to both of you for being here. It's great to see you again today. I know coming to a standing committee is not an easy thing to do, so I really do appreciate you prioritizing it. It's great to get a look at some of these numbers, and I'm just curious what from the data that you collected stood out the most to you? Um, from our housing survey, um, the part that really stood up to me was 79.41% um, of students said that the current housing in Charlottetown has really affected their academic, academic ability. And most of them also pointed that um, due to the rates of 
um, housing in Shallow Town. They've not been able to move out from their um, current houses and, you know, go look for an affordable one. And some of them also le left some responses that um, they live an hour away and not everything offered that UPI is available to them since um, they can't afford, they can't change their housing or go to a more affordable housing or a housing that is closer to UPI. And some of them said they get very tired due, due to traveling a long distance to school every day. And some of them said they have to work more hours than they really need to. And someone also pointed that income these days become a priority instead of education because of the housing in Charlottetown. Yeah, I think the one that sticks out most to me is um, the fact that of 665 respondents, 81 students had thoughts of suicide. That's about 12%. Every year in our survey, we ask that question, hoping it, um, that percentage gets lower. This is an increase from by 1% of the last time we asked that. Um, so I think that j just kind of goes to show that it hasn't gotten better, um, and it's I mean, I don't think I have to explain why it's concerning. Lynn? Thank you, Chair. And both of those points, I think, are extremely powerful. I'd like to unpack each of them a little bit, if we could. On the affordability point, Ayabosa, that you raise, it's critical. And you're absolutely right. It means people are focusing instead of on their studies on all of the other components. And I know that the student union, as Gord has pointed out, has called on government to expand the mobile rental voucher program for students in the past. I'm curious if you've had any further conversations with government on that to try to bring um, affordability in line with what students can actually manage, or if there are any other solutions you would like to see government focusing on on the affordability issue. I'll start with that one, and then I'll come back to Adam, if that's okay, Chair. Um, um, over the summer, we've met with um, a couple of government um, relations and we've also presented our priority to them but that's just more of um, an introduction into our uh, previous advocacy documents and not the advocacy documents for this year. Thank you, thank you Chair. And I recognize you may not have created some advocacy documents for what you're going to focus on this year but are there any things, any themes that you think are going to be important on affordability in the coming year to support students? The top um, of your head. In terms of housing, yeah. um, our main focus this year was just for the government to create um, a more affordable house for students, um, like a student dedicated housing for students. Yeah, absolutely. Do one more? Just one more, please. Yeah. Thank you. Chair and Adam, you spoke about mental health and uh, suicidal ideation for students, which is extremely concerning. We all know the challenges we face in the mental health sector, and they're huge. There's no question. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm curious if there are any things that you are advocating for, anything you'd like to see from government to support student mental health. Yeah, um, I think this one really starts with funding, funding UPEI to um, create more resources or hire more resources. Um, I have been advocating for for a, um, a, a mental health counselor on campus who comes from the BIPOC community. Currently, we don't have that. Um, and I think that would, um, that would increase accessibility of mental health resources for our BIPOC students. Um, so that's the, that's the big one that comes to mind. That's a great suggestion. Yeah, thank you. I'll go back on your list. Okay, perfect. Thank you, Trish. <laughs> Thank you, Chair, and thank you so much for being here today uh, in between classes. It's a, it's a busy day <laughs> for both of you. Um, you mentioned um, when you were talking about student income the role of uh, domestic students being able to access EI and, and uh, you know, how important that is or what impact that can have. So I'm wondering if you could elaborate a bit on um, uh, you know, how important is it for students to be able to access EI um, while they're in school? Yeah, I, I, I think it's it's pretty crucial, um, you know. The EI program, of course, isn't ideal for students because not all students can access it. But for the, for the students that can access it, I think it's I think it's great because it's allowing students to focus fully on their studies while also they're making a bit of money um, as a, a byproduct of their summer work. So. 
I, I think the EI program is great. I wish it was accessible to all students, but of course that's, that's not the way it is, but I, I think it's great. Trish? Thank you. And um, it, it's my understanding that that, uh, a similar, that similar program in New Brunswick was canceled. Um, it, are there concerns that, uh, that you're hearing from students um, that the program will be canceled here as well? Um, no, we're, we're not concerned about that. I had a conversation with actually the UMB Student Union President about that, um, and rightfully so. He was quite upset about it, but um, based off our conversation, it seems like it might be something that's just kind of isolated to New Brunswick um, from what he can tell, um, so I, I'm not concerned. We're not concerned about it. Trish? Okay, well, that, that's certainly glad to hear. It sounds like if, if it were canceled, it would have a drastic impact on, on the students here in Prince Edward Island and, and their ability to, uh, to meet their financial basic needs. So, yeah. okay, good. Absolutely. Um, uh, one of the other things that uh, you noted here in your survey that I kind of was surprising to me, the, um, the cost of housing affecting uh, the ability to pursue full-time studies. And I think uh, at UPEI in particular, it's, uh, you know, most programs are geared toward a full-time, you know, the assumption that students are able to, to be there full-time. Yeah. Um, so are you hearing that students are, are having to make that choice to reduce the number of classes that they're taking? Um, and what are some of the impacts that is having on, on those students? Um, actually, yes, um, a lot of students are saying they're having to reduce their courses. Um, let's say a student would want to take five courses in a semester, but because of um, other bills that they have to pay, they will have to reduce it to three courses. Or domestic students that can take less than three courses, they have to reduce it to two courses in a semester so that they can be able to pay for other bills in the year. Yeah, and when a student reduces their course load beyond uh, three, they lose their full-time student status, which means they they become ineligible for George Coles, uh, like uh, many scholarships and other financial opportunities. So, Trish, one more. Okay, yeah, um, and you know that was a follow-up question actually that I had. Um, you know the different uh, types of experiences that student might have, students might have, whether they're full-time or part-time, or you know if they are international students or students coming back to get a second degree. Of course, they can't qualify for the George Coles bursary if they're coming for a second degree. Um, you know, graduate students ha often have less access. So I wonder if you could highlight uh, or expand a bit on some of those differences that um, you know students in different types of situations might. Uh, be experiencing in terms of find access to financial supports. That's a that's a very good question. Um, well, I guess I can I can start with the George Coles. George Coles, like EI, um, certainly isn't ideal because just because it isn't accessible by all students. However, it is great. Um, you know, there are a lot of different scholarship opportunities at UPEI. Um, there's a, a fall award cycle and a winter winter award cycle that every student can apply into and hopefully receive some money credited towards their account. Um, but you know, in terms of in, say in a domestic student compared to an international student, as I said, international students can only work 20 hours a week outside of the university, um, whereas a domestic student cannot work and claim EI. Um, so there certainly is a a difference there, a, quite a difference. Um, and another thing with international students is there are some scholarships that are specific to international students. However, their scholarship opportunities are still less. So international students certainly have to um, produce their own funds much more so than a domestic student or a Canadian born student would have to in general. And, uh, oh, sorry, yeah, go ahead, Brian. Yeah, and to add to that, UPI also have a scholarship for full-time students, so if you're able to take more than 10 courses in a year and you get um, a certain um, GPA average, they will give you the scholarship. So students that are not able to take full-time courses in a year won't be able to qualify for that scholarship, and that also affects students as well. Thank you. Um, yeah. I'll just, I'll just, can I just make a comment? I mean, that sounds like it would certainly disproportionately impact those students who come from a lower socioeconomic status background who would be more inclined to have to work as well um, and then not able to access those opportunities. So that's a huge problem. Yeah. That's all. Thank you.
Thank you, Trish. Brad? Thanks, Chair. And thanks for coming here and presenting. It is, it is fun to be in front of a standing committee, I know. <laughs> um, so I think it's well established uh, that there are um, stresses on students when it comes to housing and then and your stats bear out yet once again that it causes some mental health stress as well. Um, so I, I'm really interested in, in the solutions and you talked about some of them earlier, like the homestay program is, is, really, is really great. Uh, but one of the things you mentioned was that the vacancy rate is low and you know it's, it's a matter of finding places for students to live. Um, one thing I'm interested in, um, I know uh, it's been a long-standing tradition of you know groups of students to get together and you sort of rent a house and everybody lives in a room and they pool their money and they can rent the house. Um, do you know how many students are doing that versus how many are really looking for you know one or two person apartments? Um. We don't have a figure on that, no. I, I was thinking, may, may, uh, thank you, Chair. I was thinking maybe for next year's survey, that might be something to look at to see if, if that's a potential, some supports to allow multiple students to live together and in houses and rent houses, you know, if there was a way to, to support it, might be a solution. Um, the other thing uh, I wanted to ask about, um, and this is, again, it's more of a long term, but again, if you're looking at vacancy rate, you're looking at increasing the amount of housing. Um, uh, have you, have you looked at uh, co-op housing uh, within a university context? I know that that has been successful at many other uh, universities uh, across the country, um, being that uh, it re requires a, a certain uh, level of care and cooperation, and university students, I think, are well positioned to do that. Have, have you pursued co-op housing at all? Um, what exactly do you mean by co-op housing? Oh, okay. Chair? Yeah, Brad? Yeah, so th this is, uh, this is uh, basically housing that um, is owned by a cooperative, so it's, it's not like you're renting from some of the people who live in the housing are the ones that own it type idea, and it may be suited to graduate students sometimes more than undergrads, but you can ha usually have a mixture of people. Um, and I know uh, that when I was Minister of Housing, the Community Housing Fund um, was going to uh, put aside some money to allow the uh, UPEI and the student union in particular to, to study that option, to find out what co-op housing could mean. Um, and, I, and this community housing fund is a really good source of funding for that. So that's something, I don't know, you might want to check it out and see if uh, it could help you look into how co-op housing could be an option at UPEI. Do you have another question, Brad? Um, yes. Uh, I, I, actually, no, no, Chair, that, that's good for me. Thank you for coming in. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hal? Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank both of you for coming in today. Um, so anything that, um, that can help any individual <coughs> to pursue post-secondary, I'm willing to support. Um, but you mentioned earlier about the EI program. You mentioned it twice that it's not accessible to all. Can you just elaborate on that? What, what is, what's the feedback you're getting from those individuals who say it's not accessible? What are the reasons? Um, well, it's pr uh, primarily what I meant by that is international students, of course. Uh, um, if you're not a Canadian citizen, I, I believe, is the level um, you need to um, acquire EI. But um, there is also a handful of students who maybe don't collect enough hours throughout the summer to, um, to be able to access it. Of course, at the moment, we're... Um, just in a couple days going back to the two zones mm -hmm. um, which is go excuse me going to make it much more difficult for students in that central region to uh, collect DI um, and we're hoping that it doesn't go back to two zones but that's a separate conversation I guess but um, yeah so it's basically just international students and also trying to build up those hours Okay. And I can understand Paul? that, Chair. I can understand that because uh, you have to be EI eligible in order to participate in, in the Career Connect program. Mm -hmm. um, and you, it's either Canadian citizen or have a permanent residency. So I can understand that. I can understand uh, the one-year wait because there has to be a work um, experience, uh, a workforce, whatever you want to call it, attachment to it. Um, but um, the hours is concerning. I know you talked about New Brunswick. Uh, ending the program um, and Prince Edward Island. I haven't heard anything yet, but it is up to the province. It's a LMDA agreement that the minister of the province or territory can sign off 
on any students, and that's where you go through Skills PEI, they'll do the Career Connect, uh, that they don't have to be actively seeking work, right? So they can concentrate on their studies and yeah. such, right? So, which is a really, really good program. It's something that I had advocated for several years ago because other jurisdictions were doing it, and we were not doing it. And I wanted to make sure that students, especially in my area of the western end of the island, had an opportunity to uh, attend post-secondary. There isn't any in our area, right in, in the Tignish area, let's mm -hmm. say. So the majority of them would have to go off-island or to, to UPEI, and the accommodations was an issue. So this would help them, you know, at least there was some money coming in. Yeah. The hours is very concerning after September 24th, I think is when they're looking 26, at going back. Like. And uh, so that is something that I will be, uh, that I am aware of, and I'll be uh, addressing if it does become a huge concern for, for the students uh, moving forward. Um, do you, or has there been any um, survey done on how many students at UPI actually are your, um, in Career Connect? Are you using that program? Uh, we don't have that yeah. that number, no. Okay, but I'm but just help. Thank you, Chairman. Just, and again, just I'm just glad that you shared that. That was uh, um, very um, supportive and helpful to the students, and that uh, you shared your concerns of what um, I guess what other jurisdictions, what's happening there, and to be proactive that it doesn't happen here. So thank you. Thank, Thank you, Hal. So we do have about 10 minutes left. Um, we're going to go back through, and I do uh, have, we have a guest, Annabelle, here this afternoon. We're going to try to get her, uh, she has a question or two. So we will go back to you, Gord. Uh, thanks. And I'm, I brought up the, uh, uh, the budget books from the fall, or the, sorry, the spring last year. So I'm looking at the, the, the spring budget books, and I'm looking at UPEIs, and it's, it's just it's striking that with inflation going up and the student needs going up, that basically, the needs of UPEI or the, the money that the province gives to UPEI, mm -hmm. it didn't move. It stayed, it stayed stagnant. Yep. And if you take out the medical school that was in there, $4 million in the past, it actually went down. Mm -hmm. So my question is, does, does that surprise you? Are the needs growing? Do you, do, does UPEI and the student body at UPEI need more funding from the province to operate or... Um, well, yeah, certainly in terms of mental health and housing, um, but, but yeah, so if, you know, the lower amount of money that the province gives you PEI, the more amount of money the students will get, be giving you PEI. So, um, right now, um, I am, like, we are greatly concerned with next year's tuition because, um, the university and faculty are in bargaining, and of course with new monetary um, things that come up there will you know there's going to be more costs for the university most likely once an agreement has been reached so the odds of that coming from tuition are fair are, are fairly great um, but you know back to last year um, in terms of yeah I, I was surprised that that we didn't get more from the province um, Thankfully, uh, UPEI kind of took it easy and only gave us a 2% increase, which, you know, compared to a s almost 7% inflation, that was quite generous. Um, and that's been consistent with every year. Every year it only goes up by 1% or 2%. So, um, but, but yeah, to answer your question, we were fairly surprised that we only got that much. Right. So, one more so, question there, buddy. So was I. Um, uh, in that same section, there's a section in here It says, it quotes, it says, mental health supports. And um, in 2023, it went from, it went to $275,000. That was, that's all we have, that's all the information that we have is mental health supports that went to the University of Prince Edward Island in the form of cash from the province. That went up $50,000 from the year before. Under your stats, it says out of 638 respondents, 65% have not accessed the available mental health supports from UPEI. So the province has given more money for mental health, because this is what we're going to hear. Mm -hmm. The province is giving more money, from, but, but the students aren't asked. That, there's a gap there. And how does the student, how does the student council, or how do you, do you want to be more part of that? You're, you're in relations to the students, you're there. Um, you see a difference in the mental health supports, but the students aren't getting the, the, the service. Can you just talk about that? What can we do, because this is my last question, yeah. <laughs> is what can we do to make sure the students are receiving better mental health supports? 
Um, well, I, I, yeah. Um, I think one part of it could be awareness. Um, you know, they're quite frankly, students might not be aware that UPEI has these supports, and if they are aware, they might not know how to access them. Um, I think another part is um, of accessibility of them itself. You know, I know, you know, in Dalton Hall, there are a handful of excellent counselors on the fifth floor, but they only they can only see so many people at one time. Um, I know in the health center there are, are um, you know doc you know doctors who can you know prescribe you medication and stuff, but the majority of the people that are working up there are also faculty who are teaching classes in psychology. So um, I think it it's com um, the communication and awareness and also the accessibility of the supports. Thank you, uh, Lynn. I know I'm hearing from a lot of people who are struggling with food security lately, and I'm curious if this is an issue you're seeing at the university, if you could speak to that a little bit. Um, yeah, that's, that's a good question. Uh, we don't have any figures on that. We do know our food bank as well as the university's food bank both get used fairly regularly. Um, the Vice President of Finance would know better than, than we would as she oversees it, but um, yeah, they, they get used fairly regularly, so we could assume that food insecurity is a, a real issue. Um, last year when we did receive a one-time grant from the, Minister of uh, the Ministry of Education, um, part of it was used on grocery store gift cards, um, and they were applied, and where students could apply for them, and they, uh, like, we went through them pretty quick, so, yeah. Lynn? Thank you, Chair. And the other question I will ask you today, recognizing you have to leave soon, <laughs> is about co-op placements and mm -hmm. uh, job opportunities. I know that's something that the UPEI Student Union has called on government to fund more of in the past to allow students to get work experience. <coughs> I'm curious if you feel like that's been funded adequately or if you'd like to see that expanded. Um, to speak on the co-op, I think um, I would like to see the government um, expand the opportunities because right now in UPI, not all departments have um, cooperative education and that limits the students that have access to that experience in school. Yeah, I, I do know there is um, some sort of, um, I guess you'd call it an issue with international students and co-op placements. Um, there's some sort of permit that has become very hard to get or something. It's a, it's a situation I'm not familiar with and something that the university has been primarily dealing with instead of us. But um, I do know, I can look into that for you and I know we're back Friday so I can give you some more information on that. Thank you. Thanks, Lynn. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Hannah? Thank you, Chair. Um, a couple of quick questions. So one of them is around with your rental stats, um, that we know that we've, there's always been a narrative that university students leave at the end of the university year. And we've had a lot of rental accommodations where students could only rent from the fall until May and then go. Yeah. Um, but we also know that that's not actually the case. It's more students taking summer courses or students who are living right through the year because they don't go home. Has that, I know that's not reflected in the information you give me, but has that, is that even, are you hearing about that even anecdotally, the challenge of the summer and being evicted in the summer for summer rental? Um, I'm not, <coughs> I don't know about you, Bosa, but I, I know I haven't heard much about that. Um, I do know there are a lot of students who, that do go home in the summer and they actually try to get out as quick as they can once their exams are over so that they don't have to stay and pay another month's rent. But... Um, no, I, I haven't heard much about that. Okay. One more question there, Hannah. Thank you. Um, just a couple of uh, quick follow-up, and again, we can perhaps talk about it a bit more on Friday, but um, in, my, in my district, I have a lot of the university students, the same as my colleague here. Um, I have at least two houses that I've been to recently. One has seven students living in it, and the other one has 11 students living in it. So absolutely, sort of multi-student households to cope with, is one of the realities. Um, and it means for very difficult, but you said that's an aspect of mental health as well, is that, that the living conditions we, we have to have aren't necessarily what we would choose mm -hmm. for our mental health. Um, and so I think that connection between housing and mental health is a really important one. 
Um, the other one that um, I'd be happy to bring some information back for you is on co-op housing, which is a bit more complicated um, than perhaps some may feel. Um, there is money available, but it requires there to be capacity. And what I'm hearing is, and what I understand is from the university, is that there isn't capacity within the department to actually establish co-ops, which you then have to have in existence to then be able to access money. So that's something that long term would be really great to look at for the university, but it does require, again, some investment and education. And sometimes that's also really hard to do when you've got a lot else on your plate. Um, so I guess my last, my question to that is sort of, you know, when you look at this, what do you, well, who do you need to partner with in the community? Or maybe you don't know yet what you don't know, but who do you need to partner with in the community that, that, can, that, that perhaps government can facilitate with to help address some of these, these challenges? You know, like, is there things outside the space that we could help you with by connecting? Yeah, um, I do know that there's kind of some common landlords that very often re um, rent out to students. Like I know Zakem, um, mm -hmm. often Arbert, and actually Arbert also has um, like the um, that subsidizes seniors housing, so that could be an opportunity for subsidized student housing. Mm -hmm. um, but there's also Killam, um, Tim Banks, um, and a uh, uh, like. Uh, uh, cap rate. Yep. So, um, like, the, the I think there's actually a list on UPI's website of those and a few others. But they uh, so the, those would be some good potential avenues for the province to work with. I think the majority of those developers, I'm sure, would be interested in in building on maybe the old cat property or somewhere close nearby. Um, mm -hmm. Perfect. Thank you, Hannah. And uh, we're very short on time, but Gord has asked for one extra question. I will grant it, or you're good? Or? Yeah, no, I'll, I'll just say we're putting in recommendations um, to the legislature in, in the fall. What, what is it, like the student union, the student, what, what do you want to necessarily, what do you need to see in there in that report? And how can the student union, um, would the, if, the, if I was to, if the government was to give the student union Funding, could you help solve some of these issues? Um, yes, um, we also have another priority this year, which is um, open educational resources. And we think if we get more funding from the government, although we received fifty thousand dollars last year, we think if we get um, that fifty thousand dollars this year or more than that, that will also help reduce. Um, or help save students money in terms of getting textbook and other educational materials. And also um, for housing, we think if um, the government provide or find more um, affect affordable housing for students, that will also um, help save students money during the academic year. Yeah, I completely agree. Um, I think a big one could be subsidized housing and providing affordable housing through a subsidy, um, and as well as um, maybe kicking some funding towards UPI for some extra mental health resources, although I am going to follow up and find out exactly where some of that money has gone, but um, yeah. Thanks, Gord. I, I hate, this is such a great discussion, I hate to end it, but it is 2.17, and I know you're both uh, on your way to uh, another class, and um, members, uh, Adam will be back, uh, and I'm not sure if Yavos is back sure, on sure Friday as well, but I'm sure that uh, if you do have some questions that you maybe can get the answers to, you can. So we're going to take a very short recess, you guys can make your way to class, and thank you so much for coming in today. Thank, thank you. you.
And uh, we'll continue on with the agenda. So uh, yes, uh, for the people that are watching online right now, um, unfortunately, Holland College, uh, very last minute, could not uh, attend the uh, presentation today. So our clerk is trying to reschedule that. Um, and as mentioned before, Adam and uh, Iwoso will come in uh, on Friday, which is our next scheduled meeting, uh, Friday at 9.30. And that will also feature the International Student Office as well as the UPEI Student Union. Um, at this time, is there any new business? that any of the members have. Sounds good. Can I get a motion for adjournment? So moved, Hal Perry. Thank you.